Ernie was unhappy for most years of his life. Yet he lived to be a hundred. Was his fate a cruel joke? Millie died at 98 in the Grandview Nursing Home where no one came to see her. Hardly anyone knew she was gone. Solitary Ralph got a lethal injection for a couple of murders he committed oh so many years ago. With nary a vigilous chanting in the driving rain. They say he read the classics to pass the time away with a fondness for Melville, Hawthorne, and Poe, yet declined to share any last words with those dying to know the story behind his amused smile. Larry was a jogger who celebrated his 83rd birthday with a jaunt around the pond, whence he died with his sneakers on, like he always said he wanted to. Indeed, a society of octogenarians, calling themselves the Merry Medheads, flaunt their accumulation of decades at all the local parades. But Vincent thumbs his nose and cries, give me Jimi Hendrix as a role model for my life. He who found true enlightenment before age 27, connecting cosmic dots by listening to Beethoven for guidance in symmetry, then applying it to electric funk, raising the sounds of music to the level of the gods. Give me Joan of Arc while still a teenager with the integrity to burn for her beliefs. Give me Jesus walking brashly upon the water in his early 30s. Give me the unknown soldier lying in satisfaction these many years, knowing he sacrificed his life for a noble cause. Again, henceforth can do no harm. Give me my old dog Hank, who harassed all authority figures throughout his brief 10-year career before slipping out through the back fence one too many times. So spare me longevity, O ye weavers of destiny. Give me insouciant impertinence, wherein I'll paint my masterpiece in the middle of the square, in the middle of the night, to be gaped upon by all when the sun rises in the morn and I shall fear not the firing squad. Thank you. Darkness dances between parallel atmospheres, surrendering its breath to dawn. The scattering illumination of twilight gracefully gives birth to a new day as the first rays of light cascade over the horizon, meeting me at its shore. This eternal rising, an ever-present sacred energy, calming, focused, restorative. Here, in quiet contemplation, I am by myself, just myself, but never alone. Life is an art form, an epic voyage of rediscovering the artist as work of art. Weathering the storm is par for the course, when the storms are brewing, dark clouds in tow, and the winds are howling, surely you know it's a matter of time before swift flashing rain sweeps down on you hard with the grip of a chain. No one plans to be there, but when you're there, you know it. A turbulent past must be released from deep in the mansions of your soul, where dark hearts dispel midnight dreams, we're crying. The ultimate human emotion resides, where healing becomes wisdom, and wisdom becomes strength. Nothing in nature is by accident. Everything we do is related to everything we do. The collective past pales in comparison to the future. Before the beginning, there was nothing. 
in the beginning, there was something. In between is everything. In the end, there will again be nothing. Embrace this moment as the rest of your life is always 100%. Thank you. When endless February yields to March's blowy bluster and brighter days presage a change for lives that lack in luster, I emerge from hibernation, raise my head, look around, venture forth to wander the streets of my hometown. Navigate the puddles, avoid the icy flows, and discover frozen fossils in mounds of dirty snow, dirty snow. Where once was clean and crystal, dirty snow now sheltering a mystery of what will be revealed when springtime breezes blow and melt away those mounds of dirty snow a broken side view mirror Crumpled cardboard tray Bicycle half buried Mitten gone astray Here's a handbill for a concert Cancelled by a blizzard And something I don't recognize Maybe it's a lizard? And canine copro lights to keep me careful where my feet go as I walk the streets of town past mounds of dirty snow dirty snow where once was clean and crystal dirty snow now sheltering a mystery of what will be revealed when springtime breezes blow and melt away those mounds of dirty snow. Wander past detritus of winter in the city. Contemplate the substance, the volume, the variety that stimulates the senses, visual and olfactory. The evidence, the effluence of urban humanity. Looking past the grime and garbage One thing I know There are daffodils and crocus Beneath the dirty snow Dirty snow Where once was clean and crystal Dirty snow Now sheltering a mystery of what will be revealed when springtime breezes blow and melt away those mounds of dirty snow melt away those mounds of dirty snow thank you
Rejoice, we're finally out at sea again with all our ties to land cast off. The last of it went under with the sun. The night surrounds us now, the sails softly pulling. The others lie asleep below. Only the stars appear to keep me company on this mute and vacant sea. Though all is featureless and bare, when last I checked, uh, sorry, when last I checked the chart, it showed that near at hand lie unseen, unnamed ocean glades where humpback whales glide and sing, all at their majestic gla glacial pace. Great, gentle, cloud-like beings drifting with currents too slow to sense. As we approach their range, our boat bows and curtsies in graceful, mazy arcs. I lean my back against the helm and watch the mast sweeping across vast fields of stars, infinite landlessness. I would not trade this hour for anything I know. Rock me gently, ocean. I'm coming home. A long, dark wire winds and coils down through the midnight ship to a listening point beneath the keel. Up, out of the dark waters pour wild arias, cantatas, magnificats, recitatives, and requiems, whose boiling echoes are tumbling and cascading around the cathedral vaults of the sea, a mad welter of resonance, a seething, irrepressible contrabass, mezzo, soprano, falsetto of whale song, the wildest, most joyous music of all. All night long we are borne along by that music. The watches rotate and shift. Each lone helmsman takes his turn, and each by dawn is changed forever. Thank you. We lived in a slab house, shingled and dark, we were renting back then. Mommy painted us. My blue umbrella was satin, just the right size for my hands. It was not really for rain, more a parasol. Powder blue umbrella in hand, I started to cross the street to Gina's. Two. I remember lying in the driveway Mommy waiting impatiently for the ambulance that took forever. Then Mommy holding my hand. Then the wheelchair, the hospital, the teeth shaken out of me, being carried everywhere for a week before I regain my balance and the get well cards from nursery school. Later, the visit to a doctor supposed to check my hearing, who had put his hand so deep I had to bury the memory. Three, I never liked shrimp growing up. I thought it was because mommy only cooked it frozen and it smelled like a frozen toilet. Later, mom said I used to love shrimp and that the day I was hit by the car, I threw it up on the driveway, and after that, I wouldn't eat shrimp again. It was a long time before I knew shrimp didn't have to stink. I never told mom about the bad doctor. By the time I remembered, I knew what it smelled like, and I didn't know what I remembered. Thank you. When we moved in, you said how good it was to see lights shining again in our small house. You weren't alone yet. Neither of you seemed old. Evening by evening, leaning on his hoe, I watched Dick, bent and lively, wielding his Morning by morning, saw you hang your wash, a long line propped lopsided by a pole, shifted mid-morning for the shifting wind. 
hot days, late afternoons, perched side by side, you watched the traffic like a matinee, naming the whole world's business or trying to and probably told some knee slappers on us, your well-intentioned, wayward neighbors, who stayed awake all hours of the night, or fell asleep and left the lights to burn. Now lamps set up on timers pretend to be you echoing, following room to quiet room, the predictable pattern of your widowhood. By my window, I still check across the lawn, hear your wry voice as clear as if you called. Something I still need something I still might find there. The Empowered Woman. The Empowered Woman, she moves through the world with a sense of confidence and grace. Her once reckless spirit, now tempered by wisdom. Quietly, yet firmly, she speaks her truth without doubt or hesitation, and the life she leads is of her own creation. She now understands what it means to live and let live, how much to ask for herself and how much to give. She has a strong yet generous heart, and the inner beauty she emanates truly sets her apart. Like the mythical phoenix, she has risen from the ashes and soared to a new plane of existence. Unfettered by the things that once that posed such resistance. Her senses now heightened, she sees everything so clearly. She hears the wind rustling through the leaves, beckoning her to live the dreams she holds so dearly. She feels the softness of her hands and muses at the strength that they possess, her needs and desires she has learned to express. She has tasted the bitter and savored the sweet fruits of life, overcome adversity and pushed past heartache and strife. And the one thing she never understood, she now knows to be true. It all begins and ends with you. Thank you. Malice in Latin means apple, as well as evil. No wonder the apple embodies both good and bad, purity and eroticism. When I moved to Old Frog Pond Farm, I found many rows of red delicious apples growing in the orchard. The flavor of Red Delicious is quite boring as apples go, so I decided I would change them over to another variety. To do this, you need cyan wood, the term for the small twigs of first year growth that are used to graft onto a trunk, branch, or rootstock. I went to a cyan wood exchange and grabbed a twig of the Almada apple along with several other varieties that were spread across an old pool table. Not knowing anything about its characteristics, I chose Almada because it was named after one of the largest cities in Kazakhstan, Almaty, which translates as full of apples. Almaty is near the foothills of the Tian Shan Mountains, the forests that are the birthplace of our domesticated apple. And today, pears, apples, plums, and cherries still grow in the wild in these forests and are sold in the markets in Almaty. I took my cyan wood home and grafted a red delicious tree with this Almada. After three years, which is all it takes, when this tree developed its first flower buds, 
I was surprised. Apple blossom buds are usually enrobed in a pink sheath, which then open to pale white petals. The Almada buds weren't pink, however, but dark red, like the scarlet letter adorning Hester Prine's chest in Nathaniel Hawthorne's novel. Four days later, when the orchard was a cloud of white petals, this tree's blossomed open to a lovely pink. When the leaves came in, they were not green, but a bronzy color similar to some crab apples. After pollination, its dime-sized apples were dark red, not green like every other apple in the orchard. All summer long, I kept my eye on this tree. Friends walking with me through the orchard would remark, what's that pointing to the Almada? It was easy to see that this tree was marked. The apples were quite small, but perfectly formed and deep red. In mid-August, I stopped by the Almada to taste one of its fruits. My large bite of apple exposed deep plum colored flesh. It was crazy and wonderful and all wrong. It didn't look like an apple at all, but more like a ravishing purple plum. It was hard and sour, not yet ripe. Charmed, I hurried back to the house to share my discovery with my family. I looked up Almada and learned that this red-fleshed apple was developed by a Dr. Nels Hansen at the South Dakota Agricultural Experiment Station. Dr. Hansen was inspired to breed a red-fleshed eating apple after seeing one growing on his 1897 trip to Russia. The Almada is the cross he made between a Russian apple, the beautiful Arcade, and Fluke 38, a crab apple. Even though our Almadas were not quite ripe, I decided to use a few of them in an apple galette. The red <coughs> Almada wove, wove lovely red ribbons through the white apples of the dessert. It held its color even when cooked. I made a Russian apple cake next and was again delighted by the red slices of the Almada flowing through the cake. Even when fully ripe, the Almada's taste is still sharp, but biting through its deep red skin and into the ruby-colored flesh, the sensual appeal is greater than biting into any white-fleshed apple. Although some people say that the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil was actually a pomegranate, I disagree. I can imagine the serpent winding around a branch tempting Eve with a ripe, red-fleshed apple. How could she have refused? Would you have resisted? If you come for an orchard visit, I'll show you the tree. But be prepared, there might just be a snake. <laughs> Thank you. There's a woman I know Who says she can read the future By looking in people's eyes And when she looks in mine She only sees the light Yes, she sees the whites of my eyes And I'm not gonna die
Now would you believe her if you were looking through my eyes? Would you want for yourself such a wonderful life? Stretched out across the stars Across the dying stars oh, Would you Wallow, would you wallow? Would you wallow? Thinking, how can I? deserve this